Today we have Tiffany Perkins Munn with us as our featured speaker. Tiffany is a managing director at BlackRock, where she heads up research analytics and data for the global marketing team. She also holds a PhD in psychology and statistics. She's an AEF board member and was recognized in 2020 as an AEF talent champion. In fact, she really cares deeply about you all and the next generation of marketing talent and will share as much advice as she possibly can to help you navigate your next career steps. So before we get started, I just want to remind everyone again that you will all be on mute. Um, Tiffany will be pausing throughout the presentation to take questions, so we encourage you to use the chat function to do that. Or if you want to come off mute to ask your question directly, especially at the end, just use the hand raise function and I'll call on you and you can take yourself off mute that way. All right, I think that's it. So Tiffany, you can take it away. Do you want to comment on where the hand raise function is, Sarah? Uh, yeah, so um, for me, it's on the participants. I know you guys, uh, you know, are students and you use Zoom nonstop, um, but so it, it shows up on the participants tab um, if you need to know where that is. On participants under more, under the three ellipses when you click on more. So, but you guys are experts there. <laughs> yeah, you guys are also good at this, so <laughs> awesome. All right, Tiffany, if you want to take it away, it's all yours. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I'm really big into using the chat. So I hope that everyone uses the chat function throughout. And I want this to be more of a discussion. I don't want to just be droning on and on to you guys about all the paths and twists and turns my career has taken. I want to make sure that it's useful to you. So please feel, please feel free to stop and ask questions. I'm happy to be interrupted, as I've told Sarah and Skye. Um, but I will walk you through sort of the, you know, six, very important steps to demystifying um, your career. So I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of background about me just to show you that my career path has not been linear at all. It's been filled with twists and turns. Um, but as I'm talking, I would like for all of you to put three pieces of information into the chat for me. Um, the first is what school you go to. The second is what is your major? And the third is your year. So school, major, and year. And then that'll give me some guidance once I finish talking to you about myself um, around, about who, who I'm actually talking to on the call. So, um, I, so I did my undergraduate work at Georgetown University. And at that time I was like my major, I, I had been a pre-med major, I had changed to a psychology major and a Spanish minor. And I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And I ultimately um, left Georgetown and thought, well, let me, you know, work for a while before I decide what it is that I want to do. Plus, I was acting. So I was like, oh, I'm going to go be an actress. So I'm going to, you know, like I have this degree, undergraduate degree, but I'm going to go be an actress. And um, so I left Georgetown, which is in Washington, D.C., and I went to um uh, New York City, and I worked for the Office of Mental Health in New York City. That's a little bit of a linear path because my major was psychology, and I went to work for the Office of Mental Health, which is a path to, you know, like a direct path. But I had this sort of adjacent thing happening. I was out acting, and I thought that was a great um, career choice, this uh, um, mental health facility, because you had to be in and out. I could go to an audition. I could come back. The hours are flexible. You know, I had to accompany um, my clients to and from like the board of ed or doctors and things like that. But it gave me flexibility. So at the time I was deciding that I was going to be an actress. And so this was very helpful for me. And then, and this is going to be funny to some of you because don't ask me why, but I thought, well, if I'm not Halle Berry in like two years, I have to go back to school. Don't ask me why I picked Halle Berry. I don't even think Halle Berry is that great of an actress. <laughs> but at the time, she was really doing, you know, she was very popular. And I thought, okay, that I can do. And um, so I continued going on my auditions. And I was not Halle Berry in two years. And I decided, okay, I'm going back to school. And I decided I was, so working in mental health, you know, was very helpful. I was sort of figuring out where should I go to school? 
Should I go, should I, should it be forensic psychology? Um, should it be counseling or clinical psychology? Should it be industrial organizational psychology, social personality? I couldn't decide. I knew it was something that had to do with people and measuring behaviors because I knew I was interested in that. Like I knew enough about myself to know that I was interested in that. And so I ended up going to, um, to, get, it, to get my PhD in social personality psychology. And as I was getting my degree in social personality psychology, I ended up taking a lot of statistics courses. Because in order to do psychology, where you're measuring how people feel and think about things, what are people doing, what's meaningful, what's a meaningful action versus not so meaningful action, what's driving their behavior, how do you know what, to, you know, how is that behavior predictive of something else? So all of that is really psychology. So I ended up taking all of these stats classes accidentally. And then in three years in, um, after I had finished most of my coursework and I was about to start my dissertation, my advisor said, oh, you know, you have enough stat courses to do a double major in um, advanced quantitative methods. And I was like, oh, my, um, that's exciting. Advanced quantitative methods are like things like research methodology and statistics. Um, so I started, I kept taking those courses, kept taking those courses, and ultimately ended my ended with a degree, a joint degree in social personality and an interdisciplinary concentration in advanced quantitative methods. So every time I tell people that, they're like, what on earth is that? And how does that translate into anything that anybody's doing? And really what it is, is applied statistics, right? That's all it is. It's like, how do you apply research methodology and statistics to real world challenges, to real world behaviors? If you, tr if you take that into the educational system, that's educational outcomes. If you take that skill set to the healthcare system, that's healthcare outcomes. I took it to the business corporate world, that sort of business decisions in my space around how people make investment decisions or how people build portfolios or how we can be most profitable in sort of the investment space, right? But the, the learning there is that I actually selected a, a it wasn't just one skill set, but a, a body of skills or a group of skills that were extrapolatable, right? I could take those skills and then I could extrapolate to education, to healthcare, to Motorola to telecom to any industry, right? Retail, and in my case, the financial services. Um, so I, I still, my path still was not very straightforward because even after getting this degree and working in market research for several years, I ended up in financial services where I was, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I was there for many years. And I kind of entered not quite knowing what my strength was because I didn't grow up in the industry. And um, halfway through my career, I would say I was married. I had a child um, halfway through my career where I ended up because some Morgan Stanley, I started out doing market research. And then one of my clients was Morgan Stanley. And Morgan Stanley came and said, well, the person who's running this on the client side is going to go run prime brokerage now, and we need someone to come internal to run this client feedback program. Are you interested? So I came, that's how I ended up in financial services like 20 years ago. And I came in in a little bit as like an imposter, like I felt like an imposter. You know, people, I didn't really know the space. Um, I knew I had this PhD. I didn't really know how to apply it. Um, I didn't really know that much. And that was a little bit of a, I would say, a, a turn in my path because I was going down this path, um, really focused on psychology. And while psychology and statistics, for those who are knowledgeable about that space, they really actually go together. But I, it's, you know, still today, if I say to people, I have a degree in social personality psychology and I live, leave off the statistics or the other part because it's so long. So sometimes I just stop. They're like, what is the psychologist doing in financial services? And I end up having to tell the whole story anyway. Um, but anyway, so I ended up in financial services. I did that for a while. And then halfway through my career, I had a tragedy. Um, I was married. I had a child. She was five. 
at the time, and my husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. That was in February of 2010, and he actually passed away in September of 2010. And my daughter was five, and I was working at the time at a hedge fund, Citadel. And I was kind of like, well, you know, I was leaving my house at like five o'clock in the morning and coming home at eight o'clock. And he was managing my daughter's life, my husband, because he had left Bear Stearns because he was in financial services, too. And he had opened a um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like a fun plex kind of place where there are batting cages and kids have birthday parties and things like that. So he was local and she was my daughter was local and he was really managing her. Um, all of her, you know, she's a little girl, like, what does that involve, really? She was like, you know, three, four, five. Um, but he, when he passed away, I thought, I felt like it was very important for me to be present for her and for her to know, you know, kids have a way of taking on guilt for things that they have nothing to do with. So I wanted her to know that she didn't, I didn't want her to feel guilty. And I also didn't want, um, I wanted her to know that she could go on and be happy and healthy and still have a wonderful life and she didn't have to feel guilty. So I left the street and this was a huge pivot in my career because I left the street and then ended up opening a fitness center in Princeton, New Jersey. Totally unexpected and out of not at all anything that, you know, but what happened was that I started talking to a a franchise consultant when I left, like, what am I going to do now? I need something that's, you know, something that, I need to be local and I need to be present and I need to be um, able to come and go as I please when my daughter needs me. And I don't know how much you guys know about franchise consultants, but you don't pay them. They get paid by the the company or the business that you select. So what you want to make sure you do if you ever get involved with one is that you get a consultant with broad inventory, right? Because you get the, 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 the business that you choose is going to pay them. And you just want to make sure that they're not just exposing you to some narrow group of businesses, but that you're getting broad exposure. So you want somebody who has a lot of inventory. And um, they were talking to me about things like, Oh, um, Dunkin' Donuts. And I was like, well, how's that going to work? I'm going to get this business. And then I just could picture myself sitting around eating donuts. I just didn't feel like that was the, the best thing. So, um, and then there was this other one called, I think it was called Ducks and Hoods. It's like um, in New Jersey, commercial kitchens have to be cleaned a certain way. And so there are franchises and, you know, it has, it, there's a regulatory process. And so there's a franchise that um, handles that type of cleaning called Ducks and Hoods. But that to me sounded not at all glamorous, like lots of grease and dirt and bugs and grime. And I thought that's not exactly what I want to do. And then finally, so I went through several of those, you know, like, what do you want to do? And then um, they introduced me to Title Boxing Club. So Title Boxing Club was a fitness center where you wrap your hands, you put on gloves, you work out in a class with heavy bags to an instructor for like anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. And it was, you know, it burned up to a thousand calories an hour. And it was such an amazing, I think I was like the 17th, um, uh, the 17th franchise in the, in the history of the franchise. And when I left, we had like 500 franchises. We had a franchise in Cancun, et cetera. So that was a significant pivot um, in my, in my journey. Let me just stop for a second. Cause I think I saw a hand but it kind of went away. Did somebody put their hand up? It was an applause. Or if you put it up. It was oh, okay. <laughs> yes, I saw that. Okay, well, okay, got it. Thank you. Um, so I did that for many years. I did that for about five years so until my daughter was, you know, like she was, so she was 10 going on 11. She was going to middle school. Um, and then JP Morgan, so that was a, that was not just a pivot. That was like a, like a, you know, like a diagonal um, or like some kind of swift, brisk turn, right? And it was fine. And in fact, I did that. And then I went back to financial services because JP Morgan called and JP Morgan was like, listen, this is what we're doing. Would you like to come run this analytics team for um, sales and trading, institutional sales and trading? And, you know, I was like, no, 
I'm in another business now. You know, I'm talking to trainers every day. We're talking fitness. We have workouts. Like, it's a totally different industry. And I'm actually enjoying it a lot. And so I said no to J.P. Morgan that I would just consult. And I, I did that. I consulted for a while until they wore me down. They, I would consult. And then they were like, can you get on this call? Can you get on that call? Can you do this? Can you join this? Can you go here? And then I ended up spending so much time that I was like, I might as well just go back. And I thought that, you know, I'm just thinking you could do everything. I thought I can do both. I can go back to work full time in the city, <laughs> right? And I can run this fitness center in Princeton. And I realized that I can't, I couldn't do both. Even though I had a general manager, um, it wasn't possible for me to do both. Um, so I left and I came back to the to Wall Street, you know, to J.P. Morgan. And then from J.P. Morgan came to BlackRock, which is where I am now, to um, mainly because it was a what, what I learned about myself, though, in that in that that pit, that really that transition that I did moving into this new industry, which was fitness with the whole new crop of people and new discussions and new ideas was that I could do anything that I wanted to do, literally. And it helped me to really understand what was what I was bringing to the table um, so like I knew after that I was a badass. I just knew it because I had done that by myself. I had, you know, I was doing legal, I was doing architecture, I was doing sales, marketing, operations all alone. I didn't have any partners. Um, I was doing it by myself. So when I came back to the street, I was like, yeah, like, and, and I could spot like smoke and mirrors, you know, like people saying things, but not really knowing what they're talking about. I just, became very aware. Um, and I think it was that experience that brought it to me. And I, you know, so I said all that to say, like, that was nothing that I had ever imagined in a million years, right? Of course, you don't want anyone to pass, but, or die, but I never would have done that. That's a, that's a path I never would have gone down had that tragedy not happened to me, which is unfortunate, because I should have been um, forward thinking enough to think that, oh, I'm going to do this even, you know, for myself, like as something that maybe I might have been interested in at some point in my life, um, because it's such an eye opening, breathtaking experience to really have to, you know, eat what you kill, <laughs> you know, like every dollar that goes into your pocket is you have to make it happen. There's no corporation behind you. There's nobody who's going to cut you a check at the end of two weeks. It's none of that. It's like, if you get the dollar, you have like actually worked aggressively and hard for it. And that's meaningful. So that's a little bit of my career journey. Let me just look in the chat really quickly and see where everyone is from. Um, so I see Jamar from Central Florida. And Rishma from CUNY, Brooklyn, marketing. Mahima from Burnmir, Burnmar, Burnmar. In economics, Victoria from University of Florida. I think that's me, Doe, from Middlebury College, psychology. Drashti from Clark. Niral from Fairleigh Dickinson, graphic design and computers. Um, Benjamin, Cornell, Eduardo, USC, oh, business grad, business, business admin, okay. Um, Naya from Baruch, Jamar, oh, I think I, got, I said Jamar, but he put in uh, human, human communication and rising senior. Ram Brandwain from Minerva Schools at KGI, okay. Brittany, USC, no, University of South Carolina. Milana, Miami, Michael Clemson, Jordan, Arizona State, Christina, Fairly, oh, graduate of Fairleigh Dickinson, Lupe, DePaul University, um, Alexis, rising senior in Indiana, all over the place, you guys, Danielle Carr, Temple, Brianna Bowie, um, Danielle, University of New Hampshire, who was late, no worries, Danielle, <laughs> Pauline Ward, um, Rutgers, oh, interesting, video production, Kelly, UC Berkeley, um, yeah, nice, so it's really nice to meet all of you, I'm happy to see that you all are from everywhere, um, I am going to talk, so what I'm going to talk about 
it's not going to be the standard like, okay, do A, B, and C, and D in this order. I really want to give you guidance that I think has been helpful to me and that I think will be helpful not only as you are deciding um, career, but as you're thinking through if you want to stay in education, meaning you're undergraduate and you want to go on to graduate or you're graduate and you want to go on to postdoc or you're graduate and you want to go into, you know, go out to work and develop a career. Um, I want to talk to you about those things that I think will be helpful to you across all of those different scenarios, not just, um, you know, sort of like the one, two, threes to get to getting the best career ever. Um, because I think this will help you get the best life ever. And I think that's the goal. Uh, so before I jump in, though, I'm going to share my screen. Does anybody have any questions before I jump in? I'm just sharing my screen now. So if you have a question, you can just put it in the chat while I'm sharing my screen. Okay, so this is, can everyone see my screen? Yes, okay, because I can only see a few of you now that my screen is up. Um, so yes, we're gonna talk about the six steps to demystifying your um, career journey. And the very first step, which, first of all, let me ask any of you, can any of you guess what the very first step is? Anybody? Just take a wild guess. Um, I could go. I think the first thing you should do is create like a plan, like write down your goals, I say, and like write them down. Just write them down. That's what I feel like. Yeah. I like that, Brianna. Um, for me, what? I just kind of jumped in. What is that? Sorry. I just jumped in. You just jump in? Yeah, like just jump into it. Okay. Rimsha. Rimsha, did I say it right? Okay. Anyone else? Have a growth mindset in all that you do. Milana. Nice, Milana. By the way, all of those are the right answer because all of those are going to basically impact how you own your brand. And the first piece of guidance that I have for all of you is really to own your brand. Um, your brand is what makes you uniquely you. You have to be aware of how you come across to people. It was late in my career when I actually started paying attention to my personal brand. But really, that's something that you can start now. You can start thinking about what is it that you like? What are the things that you don't like? What are you good at? How do people see you? Um, you know, what do people think about you as expert or what do they think your skills are, right? And your brand appears in a number of different ways. Obviously, it's me talking to you and, and me understanding who you are and what you do. It's the in-person interaction. It's also how you, you know, write your resume and what you put on your resume about who you are and what you can do. And even And today, even it's even more important to have an online presence and to manage that online presence. Like sometimes people say to me, do you Google yourself? Yes, I do. I Google myself. And if you Google me, you will see that I have a perfectly curated Google page, Tiffany Perkins Munn. And that whole page belongs to me. And I have removed things from that page that I don't want there. <laughs> and I have, you know, and I make sure that the page, I'm constantly looking at the page. Right. I'm constantly I'm, I'm making sure that my Facebook page is curated a certain way because that's friends and family. I'm making sure that my LinkedIn page is curated a certain way because that's my professional face. I'm making sure that I'm putting things on Instagram and Twitter that actually speak to one of those, you know, either the professional or the personal, but in a way that I can wrap it into the way that I I guess the way that I would define my brand overall. And I think you're, you know, you want to think about like, what do, what do you think people are saying about you? Like, perhaps more importantly, what do you want them to be saying? 
Um, it's not the kind of thing that I think we can leave to chance anymore. So I really want, I want to just talk to you about five things that you can do to really manage your personal brand. Do you guys know who said your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room? Have you heard yes. that saying? Yeah. Yes. I've heard of it. That's yeah. Jeff, that was Jeff Bezos, right? It's like, Sometimes, wouldn't you just love to be a fly on the wall and hear what people are saying about you when you're not there? I know I would. I mean, that's, that's really the power of brand. And the message that Jeff Bezos is saying, this powerful but very simple message, is that you can greatly influence what others are saying about you by becoming conscious and deliberate in what you want your brand to stand for. And you're never to, I, I mean, my daughter's, um, go, she's a, she's going into um, 12th grade and I'm constantly telling her, like, you don't have to, your brand doesn't have to be this one structured set thing that it's always gonna be, but just be deliberate about how you are developing your skills and what, you're, what you want your expertise to be. Um, and, you know, and that'll help. So the first thing you wanna do is to identify characteristics you admire and those that you, do, you don't like, right? So all day we kind of see aspects of personal character that we either love and we want to emulate or we dislike and we wish to avoid. This comes from the people in our lives, like colleagues, bosses, customers, suppliers, if you're in, in any kind of business, partners, um, it's also people we read about or see on TV and on the internet, celebrities, sports stars, business personalities. Um, it's people we know deeply, right? Such as family members and friends. I mean, why reinvent the wheel when others are already giving us live action case studies and success modeling to learn from, right? You don't, you, but you should use it as a guide to kind of help you figure out what is it that you want to do? What is it that you want to say? The second thing I would say is really spend some time developing your personal brand. So I know I said here, um, it's about who you are in person, but it's also about what you say about yourself in person. It's about who you are on paper and it's about what you are, you know, what you say and how you present yourself on social media. But really you should have two lists, right? You have two lists, and here's the fun part. You actually get to develop your personal brand. Which characteristics do you feel naturally drawn to, right? Perhaps they're ones you already feel are an integral part of your personal brand, or perhaps they're ones that you'd like to develop. Um, I'm sorry, uh, my daughter's doing something. <laughs> also, um, reflect on the characteristics you dislike. Like, what traits do you want to make sure you never manifest them, that never manifest themselves in your personal brand? Or do you recognize in yourself as any and you want to eliminate them fast, right? You know what I'm talking about here. Negative characteristics that you, don't, that you know don't serve you well, but which may keep rearing their ugly heads and, and tarnishing the way people think about you, right? You may have a reputation for always being late for meetings. You rationalize, it, you rationalize it as being busy, but others perceive it as being disrespectful. Or you might consistently overpromise when making commitments while your attentions are good and you mean well without realizing it, you're really giving yourself a credibility problem. So the point here is just to draw out the key areas you want to focus on and avoid in order to build and develop your personal brand. It's, de it's really designed to be a fluid, agile process, and most importantly, fun and exciting, right, as you take ownership for building the personal brand that you want to live and be known for. Um, the third step is to do a sense check of perception versus reality. So you've made this list in step two, and it's a good representation of the personal brand you are and the personal brand you want to be. However, at this stage, it, read, it really only represents um, your view of the world and your perception of yourself. You need to explore how aligned your perception is with reality, right? So the challenge in seeing the world through only your lens and your eyes is that depending on your level of emotional intelligence and how honest you're prepared to be, you can end up with what I you know, call reality distortion. So a perception reality gap could be like an individual who 
has a high perception of their self-worth and brand position, but it's out of kilter with feedback from others. So their perception could be an eight or a nine, and in reality, it's a three. So if this were a real scenario for an individual, um, you would describe them a little bit as delusional, clearly so wrapped up in their own internal view of the world that they're just not open to feedback. So you really want to check that perception and reality space to make sure that you are positioning yourself in the best way possible as it relates to your brand. The fourth step is create your brand essence. So that's your one sentence or your strap line that clearly articulates who you are. By the way, it's going to change. I don't want anybody on the call to think like, oh my God, the sentence that I say about myself now, that sentence is going to change. The key is you always have that sentence in your head. It's always evolving. You're thinking about it. You're in college now, have that sentence about who you are now and who you are aspiring to be. You finish college, evolve that sentence into who you are at that point and who you are aspiring to be. You get a job, change that sentence, right? So this is what I'm doing now and this is what I'm aspiring to be. And all the time you're making sure that you're using language that you want people to use about you. I remember one time, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Carla Harris, but she's a pretty famous um, African-American woman in debt capital markets. She's been at Morgan Stanley for many years. And she said one time she went to get feedback from her supervisor and he said to her, yeah, you know, Carla, people don't see you as being tough. And she was like, people don't see me as being tough. And she was really shocked. And she said, but I am tough. And she said, from that point on, she started, when she would describe herself to people, she would say that she was tough. She would say, yeah, you know, they would say, well, what are your characteristics? What are your strengths, right? You know, that famous question, what are your strengths and weaknesses? She would say, well, for one, I'm really tough, right? And people started, the next year she went back for her, her review and the supervisor said, people really see you as being tough, Carla. And she was like, oh, my God, like it's, it's really those words that she was using to people to describe herself. And they were just feeding it back to her because the reality is people, if you don't describe yourself to people and give them a vision of who you are, they'll just create the vision for themselves. And you don't want them to create the vision for themselves. You want to create that vision for them. And the fifth step is really to communicate. Right. So communicate your personal brand. This is the most effect. This is most effective when you're really conscious and deliberate about your messaging, right? You got to be as conscious as Amazon or as Google or as any of the big companies and be consistent in your words and actions because people are able to believe a brand when they feel they can trust it. So you're not all things to all people. You are a very select group of things to a broader group of people, but it's clear that you know exactly who you are, right? So I don't want to spend, I'm, I know I spent a fair amount of time on brand, but I really want everyone to understand that that is going to be a critical element of your entire career, your academic career, your professional career, as you move through life, evolve your brand and take it with you, communicate about it, talk to people about it, make sure you know who it is and who you are, and that will be very important. Um, I'm just going to break quickly to see if there are any questions. What part of your brand do you think is the most fun? Um, I think the most fun part of my brand is that sometimes I meet people and who don't know me, and afterwards they're like, oh my God, you're so down to earth and fun to talk to. I would never imagine that you had a PhD. <laughs> and I think it's funny because in their head, they have this idea of who has PhDs, right? And how people who have PhDs must talk and act. And then they meet me and I'm, you know, just regular down to earth, talking about the things they talk about, doing the things they talk, they're doing, you know, doing the renegade and everything else on TikTok with everybody else. And they're like, oh, my God, she has a PhD. So to me, that's a really fun part of my personality. And I do kind of lean heavily into charisma, right? If you have, if you're charismatic, then that's how you should help to build your brand. Like I am, I am, I am someone who is very disarming. People like to talk to me. People enjoy talking to me. I'm charismatic. I'm easy to talk to. I'm not at all stuffy. 
Um, and I don't come off as I'm like so overly educated and smarter and better and than other people, right? And sometimes that's, you've seen, you know the type. Um, and so that part of my uh, brand, I really enjoy crafting because it just allows me to be who I am. The second thing that I want to focus on is to prioritize relationships as you're building your career. And prioritizing relationships really means being aware of people in your immediate and distant community, what networks they're in, and what bigger life goals they have, right? So you're going to come across people who you should stay connected with. You should stay connected with those people. You should keep, you, they should stay on your radar. You should just make sure it's, by the way, this takes time and effort and energy, really working with people, um, staying connected with people, having coffee catch ups with people. Once you meet them and connect with them, just really staying connected so that you can build that relationship and do that throughout your life. And it's really important, not only because what Jim Rohn says, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, but when you're looking for career opportunities and, and um, other opportunities in life, you're going to want to lean into those relationships that you've built, right? So your, it could be your parents' friends, could be your own friends, could be your professors, could be old employers that you really got along with, even old colleagues and, and college buddies. Like, keep those connections going. Not every single connection, but enough of them, right? Because you're going to want at some point to lean into those relationships and they're going to want to lean into the relationship they have with you. Quite frankly, every job I've ever gotten after, you know, sort of the traditional get your first job through resume, et cetera, um, as I've gotten into my career, almost every job that I've gotten has been a result of knowing someone. Someone called me because they knew me and they knew my brand. Um, I called someone because I knew them and they were hiring and I, you know, and I could, I could ask them and have a frank conversation with them about the role. Um, and it's always that kind of relationship, personal connection that gets you to the next stage or the next phase or the next space that you want to be in life. So that's very, very important. And I, I really challenge everyone on the call to like start making those connections. Like I'm doing this talk. You should link, you should connect with me on LinkedIn, right? And then you should say things like, oh, I, you know, I remember when you did that talk for AEF and keep in touch, right? And so I won't know exactly who you are immediately, but I have been in touch with someone who reached out to me when I was 15 years ago, when I was at Merrill Lynch, when I was at Morgan Stanley. And every year, he just checks in. This is what I'm doing. This is what, you know, I just wanted you to know. I thought you might be interested in this. Here's an article that you might like to read. And we just developed a relationship. I've only seen him twice in my life. And we have a relationship now if someone calls and says, oh, do you know so-and-so and can you recommend? I feel very comfortable saying yes. That's someone who I can recommend to do any number of things because we have established a relationship over the years. And it came from something just like this like speaking at a, you know, at a conference and just making a connection. So I really want you to, to understand the power of relationships and start to build and collect those for yourself. Um, the part about putting others before yourself as they will start to do the same for you is just leaning into the fact that help people out, find out what people need, right? So it's, it's don't just go to people and ask them, can they do something for you? Find out what it is that they need and offer to help them get what they need. And they'll remember that. They'll remember that Sky helped me when I needed X, Y, and Z, or that, you know, Rimsha offered to do X, Y, and Z for me, right? People will remember that. So, and then when you come to them to ask them, can they help you get the next job, move into this other career position, take some kind of step in life, they'll be more willing to do that. Number three, I think Milana, is it Milana? I don't see you on screen, but I think what you were saying was very similar to this. Lay out a plan. Declare specific goals. This is so incredibly important. Those goals will change, just like your brand is going to evolve. At each stage of your academic and professional career, your goals are going to change. You're going to have some lofty goals that will never change, right? Because that's your like North Star. 
I want to be whatever that North Star vision is. But along the way, in order to get there, you really have to declare very specific goals about how you want to achieve these things. I want to finish college, just like you do in college when you're like, okay, I have to take these classes. I want to do this internship over the summer, et cetera. You have to plan for each stage like that and do it via goal setting because otherwise you kind of flip flop. Like, oh, what should I do? I don't know. You know, you're uncertain. You're not sure. Um, Put them on paper, which is what I like to say. Work backwards to create a plan of action to make your dream a reality. I want to be a broadcaster on NBC, right? What do you have to do to be a broadcaster on NBC? First of all, start talking to people who are in the broadcast field and doing broadcast jobs. You might not get to Oprah, but you could do research on Oprah, right? Because everybody, the, the research is out there to track, you know, track Oprah's path and understand her life. And so I think there's so much research that you could do in addition to having those conversations yourself. Don't just rely on what you read on, online. Have conversations with people who are in the field, people who are in the, um, because you want to know, is it easy to get a job when I get out? Or what kind of job should I be thinking about? Or where should I be thinking about jobs? So as I mentioned to you, I'm in financial services. So people often come to me to get financial services jobs, like I want to be a portfolio manager or I want to be a financial advisor. But the reality is in financial services, there are marketing organizations, there are operational organizations, there's legal, there's HR, right? There are all these opportunities in financial services firms that are not about managing money. And you have to think about your career and your profession in that same way. What, where are the opportunities for me? Like, I wouldn't have thought, oh, psychologist with a, with, um, a degree in statistics would be, the, would be a financial services opportunity, right? But upon doing research and realizing what, what's happening in financial services and the kinds of questions that they're trying to answer, I realized this was the perfect career, a career in financial services. So just be very open and think about what those goals are, back into them, but think broadly around where you might find, put yourself, right? And then I think this is just about conversation, sharing your goals with others. The reason is because what did I say before? Build those relationships. As you're building those relationships, you're sharing your goals. People are starting to recognize who you are, what you contribute, what you need, how you can help them. So talking about goals with the people who you're building these relationships with is key. The fourth thing is to get more experience. And this is, an, this is a critical one because I think people finish school and then they're like, well, I know how to do that. Or they go to grad school and they're like, okay, well, I know how to do that. The real, reality is I am constantly learning new things. I'm taking courses in my own discipline. I wanted to learn natural language processing. I didn't know it. I wanted to really understand how to use it most effectively so that I could challenge my team to use it more. But so many things. I also decided I wanted to be like a chef on the side. So I started taking culinary courses just so I could. And I was practicing with my friends. But, I, but there's a, um, a research rigor, actually, to preparing a recipe and then, like, staging the table and laying it out that you really wouldn't think about otherwise as being connected to anything that you do. But I think that every experience that you do contributes to how you want to talk about your brand, how you build your brand. And, and how you set goals for what you want to achieve. So definitely try to get as much experience as possible. New experiences help develop skills, strengthen your personal brand. The fifth is to become an executive, you know, have an executive presence. I don't know how many of you have heard the phrase, um, dress, for you, dress for the job you want, not for the job you have. Dress for the job you want, not for the job you have right? So you want to exude a certain presence. You want to be taken seriously. You want to make sure. So even if it's a friend who offers you an opportunity to do some professional job that they do themselves and they're inviting you in, 
you don't go in with just ca- casual, not an attitude or physical appearance, right? You make sure that you are exuding an executive presence in all instances, both in what you say and how you speak, but also in how you appear. You want to make sure that people see leadership potential because people are always looking for who's going to be the leader in the room, who's going to be able to direct and guide and manage and oversee. Um, and so becoming the leader that people want to follow. And that means that you, and I think that all of this that we're talking about, like building your brand, developing relationships, setting goals, it helps you to talk about yourself in a way that is really, really authentic, right? Like you're someone that's authentic, you listen, you're open to new ideas, you're all about creativity, you empower those who are around you, you make people feel like they can get things accomplished. All of that is really important. And then finally, there's feedback. And this is, this is challenging because people are really scared to ask for feedback. Every time I do performance reviews with my team at the end of the year, you know, I'm asking for feedback from a lot of other people for my team. And then I summarize that feedback and I say, here's the, you know, the summary of how people are viewing you. But when I do that, I always ask my team to give me feedback. Because I think it's, it's very helpful for me to do better, but also I like to share it. I like to share what my team says about me because there's always room for improvement. There's, a, there's always something. You should never take feedback as um, sort of a negative outcome, right? You should just assume that there's, everyone gets feedback. There's no one in the world who doesn't get feedback that, where there's room for improvement. And if, we, and if they do, it's, it's false. It's not real, right? So there's always room for improvement. And one of the key things about feedback is that you apply it right away. If you get it and you believe it, meaning like you've gotten it from a number of different places, so it's probably an accurate observation about who you are, you incorporate it right away, right? You incorporating the ideas of those around you builds a strong community of accountability, trust, honesty, and teamwork. Because what it does is it helps people to see that you have accepted what they have said about you and are willing to incorporate it into how you um, perform in order to do a better job. And that is very, very meaningful. So really accepting that feedback and incorporating it into your way of being. So those are really the six um, elements of career building that I want, that I think are most important for you as you move through your academic career into your professional lives and on. I do see a question here. Um, Let me, I see a couple of questions. While building your brand, what advice can you give about standing out from the rest of the crowd? So I think you have to figure out where your authentic self is and how standing out from the crowd is not going to be like being the brightest, the shiniest, the the, 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 you know, the most outrageous. It's really going to be leaning into your own authenticity and through that authenticity authenticity, identifying your unique characteristics and qualities. So it's not as easy. It's actually a, a complicated, difficult thing to do because it, it, it means that you need to be retrospect, introspective and you need to be thinking about all of the things that we discussed, like what am I strong at? Where am I weak at? What can I get better at? What do I love about myself? What do other people love about me? I think all of that helps you to identify how you would stand out from a crowd. Because now me standing out from a crowd is really a combination of so many things. It's not only one thing, right? But you will remember, and each of you will remember something different about me. And they'll say, Tiffany, and you're like, oh, and, and each of you may have a unique thing that resonated with you about what I'm saying that you will remember about me. And that's how I, I'm going to stand out relative to other people who may come and speak to you. Um, do you have any advice on relationship building with a direct manager? Yes. So this can be tricky because personalities get into play and you don't always get along with a direct manager. But I think um, what I find is really helpful is making sure that you are being helpful to the manager. And by that, I mean being thoughtful about what it is that they, so keep in mind, your manager wants to look good to his or her manager. That's the goal. So what can you do 
to help your manager look better, sound better, um, perform better, um, give the appearance of really being more engaged, um, the go-to person? Like, how can you help your manager do a better job at their job? That's really what's going to fuel a better relationship um, with your manager. And in an honest way, not just like running and getting them coffee. I mean, like really being thoughtful and critical around a task. Like he, need, he or she needs to get something done. And you may not be able to do it yourself, but you did some research and you realize that they need to do X, Y, and Z in order to achieve this. And you share that with them. Oh, I know you wanted to, you know, get this thing done, but it's not in my personal wheelhouse, but I was reading this article and it suggested that you do A, B, and C, you know, just showing them that you are engaged and curious and and wanting to help, I think would be key in in building that relationship. Um, Advice on maintaining and building long-term relationships virtually. So I'll say that one of the great things about COVID has been, for me anyway, has been that I have um, a global team. My team sits in Budapest, in Hong Kong, in the EMEA regions, in San Francisco, in Atlanta, in New York. And typically, my teams meet in teams, right? So the Budapest team meets, the um, the the EMEA team meets, the Hong Kong team meets. And, and every now and then, like once a year, we come together to, I'm sorry, once a month, we come together to um, share and, and, and chat and learn about what everyone else is doing on the team. But the reality is, because of COVID, we've all had to be virtual. So there is no situation where, oh, there are people in the room and there are people on the screen and the people on the screen feel like second-class citizens because they are left out of the conversation because of the people in the room. Actually, COVID and being on Zoom and being virtual has been a great equalizer and it's served to bring these relationships together. And, and I actually started like randomly selecting people who I thought had skill sets like mine in the organization that I didn't know and just scheduling coffee chats with them. Like they're virtual. Like I wouldn't have thought be in, in before COVID, I would have only done that with people who were local to New York and I could go to their office and we could have a coffee. Now, it's just given me lots of new ideas like, oh, I can do this with anybody. I can virtually meet with anybody. So really being deliberate about maintaining and building relationships, even virtually. Like I told you, I've been friends with someone that I met 15 years ago. I've only seen twice. And before there was Zoom, we were on the phone, right? So it's just this this idea of being deliberate and connecting deliberately, not to not to um, force a conversation because it could be anything random, like, oh, my God, what do you think about that most recent presidential election? You know, it could be anything, something that's happening in the world. Um, but I think you have to be very consistent and deliberate about engaging, and that will help to facilitate those um, virtual relationships over time. So any other questions? This has been really great. I'd love to answer more questions or hear from some of you, um, whatever you think is best, Sarah and Skye. There are a couple more questions. I know you have a hard stop at seven, so we have a couple more minutes. Okay. Anyone else want to jump in before we wrap up? Last chance. And you can come off mute too, if you want. Hey, Tiffany, it's it's Gord here. Uh, Hey, Gord. For you, yeah. Um, you have uh, that sort of rare combination of a background in sort of marketing, classic marketing, uh, entrepreneurial. <laughs> uh, also, I, I'm I'm shocked and to understand that you have a background in acting as well. So thank you, but that's apparent. <laughs> but then you combine that with quantitative skills, a PhD. Uh, you kind of really focus on data and analytics. And I'm wondering, what advice do you have for everyone in terms of, you know, marrying those sort of two quantitative, qualitative parts of the equation? Is it important or not? And how would you uh, advise our uh, our interns? I would advise the interns, especially any of them that want to go into a quantitative discipline, 
that the best and most effective skill that you can have in that discipline is to be a great storyteller, right? Storytelling is key to all of this. Um, data scientists who sit back in corners and crunch numbers are no longer. Those, don't, those are jobs that are going away. It's really important for you to be able to execute the technical aspects of an analysis, of a solution, of a, you know, an engineering problem, and explain to people who don't necessarily speak that language in easy to digest um, and understand bites, right? Like, here's what we did. And, and not only sort of explaining to them what happened, but weaving it into a story. People remember stories right? If I tell you a story about my life, you're going to remember that much more quickly than if I just laid out, here are some ways, here are different ways that you might live your life, right? You're going to remember a story. Like, you're going to remember my story about Title Boxing Club. You probably will remember my story about my friend who I've been in contact with for 15 years, even though we've only met twice. You're going to remember stories. And I think a lot of schools, actually train you with technical expertise and technical acumen without really training for storytelling. And that is such an incredible, that's the qualitative part. Because even when you get, you, you know, even in, as we all know, like the qualitative and the quantitative part of research are two parts of a whole, right? They go together. Um, they're the flip sides of a coin. But in but even some of that becomes very technical and you really have to learn how to tell the story in meaningful ways that will engage the audience and get them to a place where they can then digest what you've given them and use it to answer a problem that they have or to address some challenge that they're working with. So I think those are the key elements, Gord. Great. Thank you so much. Well, we are almost Absolutely. at time. So another huge, gigantic thank you, Tiffany, uh, for your terrific presentation. Whether you're interested in data analytics or brand management or creative advertising or whatever it is, hearing advice like this from an industry leader is so important at this stage of your careers. I know many of you enjoyed it just based on your comments in the chat. Um, and we did record today's session and we'll be posting it on our site next week. So in case you want to rewatch it. That's perfect. It, there yeah and um that's basically it so i just want to uh really quickly tell you about our next session um will be on wednesday 6 30 at 6 p.m eastern featuring ann rubin who is another aef board member and vp of corporate marketing at ibm she'll be sharing stories from her career as well and tell you all the skills you need to know to set you up for a job in marketing all right that's it thank you guys so much thanks for thanks guys okay Take Stop. care.